I have sort of another theory about what a poet does and what an artist does is that, you, you know, like I'm a poet, so I read these poems. And you, when you're performing, you get a real clear feeling that what's happening is that you're holding up a mirror and you are seeing yourself in this mirror. Because there I am performing, and at least it's basically just dumb words. It's poems, but they're just dumb words. And everybody is having this very profound personal experience. But what they're doing is they're seeing themselves. They're seeing the wisdom that's in their mind already, and the mirror lets them see it, you know? And then they say, oh, it's a great poem, or this. And that's true with all of art. But particularly for poetry, in the sense like uh, an easy example was Allen Ginsberg's Howl, the poem Howl that he wrote in 1956 that had an enormous effect on me as a 17-year-old, 18-year-old boy. And, uh, and it affected, that, what it affected me as a young man, affected two million people at that instant. You know, <laughs> the whole world was transformed in the late 50s and 60s in, with that poem of Allen Ginsberg. And now Allen Ginsberg's poem is nice. It's a nice poem, but it doesn't do that anymore. I, you know, it's sort of like did its job, and now it's in the museum next to the Picassos, you know, that you go and look at it and say, oh, isn't this great? And, and it has a little bit of, it has a lot of effect, but it, so that, or if you go back to Yeats or any of those, on and back into history, certain poems transform the world. So it, so the poet and the artist are mirrors holding it up to people's mind. Dial Up Home first happened in 1968 in New York City. I was talking on the telephone one morning and was crashing. I had a hangover and crashing from some drug and was really irritable. And there was this boring gossip. This woman just went on talking about gossip, what was happening the night before. I got so furious. I was like, just, I can't stand it. I said to myself. And then I had one of those thoughts. Her, those obnoxious sentences, the words that she said, could it be a poem? One of the interesting things, and it's still true today, apropos of secession, is that one thing I, I discovered by chance, that the, the success of dial a poem was, was based on the fact I connected a telephone number to publicity, which had never been done before. Now we're in, in Vienna, in secession, and outside the building, you have this big banner with dial up on and the telephone number. So people with their cell phones can call instantly. They don't have to write the number down and go home and pick up their hard line like they did in the 1960s. They just, while they're waiting for the bus, they listen to dial up home or they... they I'm 78 years old, and, and I just keep doing it. I think probably the, one of the secrets is I'm, I just keep doing it. So your energy is continuous. It flows every day. I don't really think it has to do with age. I think it has to do that everybody in this world has to work with their mind, training the mind. I mean, that's all the Buddhism is. In meditation practice, you're training your mind. And you can do it, I mean, I'm a Tibetan Buddhist, but you can do it in any tradition. It's taking the, nat the empty nature of mind seriously and, ha and trying to work, work, work with it. And we all know how crazy the mind is. So. And uh, so I think it's the result, I would think more it's the result of my meditation practice over the years, rather than just growing old. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of myself as a Buddhist poet because one, I'm gay, I take drugs, I, you know, do everything and, and use it in some way in my work. Ugo and I are lovers for the last 17 years, so when we sleep together, which is every night or every, uh, sometimes we, we, we sleep at my place or at his place, and then, then every other day we sleep alone because we were together. So, so if so from alone, or Ugo's on tour, or I'm on tour, I get up really early. I get up at six and I do practice for an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, two and a half, depending on the day. And then I start my day, and then I'm awake, and then I have this whole series. That's the best part of my day is the morning after I've done this practice uh, to write. So that's the time I write and make 
art, paintings, you know, I do this, have this, these many projects that I work on, so I, I do all of that sort of in the morning, alternating, because writing is what I do first for an hour or two, and, and then, you know, and then my mind, so to break that, then I go down to an, uh, downstairs where I have my studio to work on the paintings, because it's a different part, writing is a, some part of the brain, and painting is another, no, not connected at all almost. And I do that for an hour or two, and then go back and write, and so back and forth. Then the emails, you know, which is you know orchestrating everything, I take up a part. So that's my my life. When Ugo and I sleep together, we get up just when we get up. Then I do my practice during the day. I have this vast collection of everything I did, which involves everybody I knew, and. Uh, that collection and, and everything I did is going to be in Palais Tokyo in October. October 18th opens this great show. Uh, not curated by Ugo, created by Ugo Rondononi because it's more than a, just a curation. He's inventing this, using this vast amount of stuff in my life, inventing this enormous show.